Thank you, Martin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Teresa. This is Dave. Um, just a bit of a hands up. Who has heard of Penrose before? Right. Um, there's a little task for you, uh, adding to the other task that you got just before. Um, there actually is a Penrose pattern very close to this building on a bench in Amsterdam. We just saw it on the way to here. Um, so if you have not, if you, um, you certainly will take some visual material with you and you most likely will find it uh, when you start walking around the area. So for today we, today, we start about, we'll give you a bit of an insight into um, what is Penrose, where did it start, but what we were interested in, like how can you deform that? Um, we will start with, Dave and I have very different practices. I'm a sculptor working with Mood mainly. Uh, Dave is a scientist and researcher. Um, he will tell you more about his work uh, afterwards. So we'll give you a bit of an insight where we come from, just to for you to make it easier to see where, where we meet. Um, thank you. So this is uh, part, a little, these are snippets of my workshop. Uh, the reason why I show this picture is um, we're talking about material or materiality as well as how material and tools work together, not so much in a two-dimensional space or on the, on the screen space, but also in the, in the tangible space. So what you see here on the screen um, are uh, wood shavings from various sculptures made with various tools. They were not intentionally created as such. They were simply things that are found on the floor and found interesting. Um, Another piece, uh, just very briefly, we'll talk about, we talk about patterns today. Wood, as we all know, has plenty of patterns. If you start to rearrange the end grain, um, you might find interesting things in there as well. If we talk about tangibility, um, I used various process to bring the pattern out a little bit more, also to make it accessible for blind and partially sighted people or people with different sight abilities. Um, thank you. In the uh, this is another one where we touch around uh, on on um, a combination of geometry and ax axial growth. So it's one piece of wood. I have various pieces of these that I found. I have two lying on there on the front as well. Um, the wood actually grew like that. The only thing I did was I enhanced the form a little bit to make the front and the end move into different shapes that are related. So one is a more of a star shape. The other one is more of a flower shape. And lastly, um, a bit of a poetic approach to symmetry. It's called Symmetry Wants to Disagree. And I will hand over to Dave. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I do quite different kinds of things. I work in between design and computer science, but I like to do things like make societies of robot sunflowers that respond to light and see how people interact with them or set up computational rules that lead to engagements with the world that hopefully contain chocolate and surprises uh, to understand how we want to relate to technology in the future. And I'm very interested in how arts and science come together. So this is an image from Smartest Residencies where we asked uh, traditional crafts, people like weavers, to work with data from space and satellites and see what they come up with and how the, the satellite traces relate to traditional practices and uh, the kind of weaving that's going on in the right hand side. Uh, so now we'll jump into what we're doing. Uh, so about half of you had, had heard of Penrose Siling, maybe half hadn't. Um, I'll start with the image that actually inspired us for this project, because we've been talking a lot about pattern and repetition and things that kind of repeat but never actually repeat. So the kind of ordered randomness or chaos um, that can come from very simple rules. And as part of the discussion, we found this, which is an image of someone who's been looking at Penrose tilings and how they relate to really strange bits of crystallography and material process. Um, so we saw this and we wanted to have a play in this space. Uh, but I'll tell you a bit about the journey that took us there. Uh, and get into the kind of the computational grain of what we did. So this is Roger Penrose uh, standing on the floor with one of his tilings on. And on the left is um, a 2D representation of the tiling. Uh, I'm saying tiling a lot. 
it's a mathematical word, but it's one that you're probably quite familiar with. It's this question of how do we cover a surface uh, with elements? And in this case, there are questions you might ask, like how many different kinds of elements do we need in order to cover a plane without any gaps? The one on the left, the mosaic, has a lot of different kinds of shape in there. The one in the middle just has one shape but rotates it. Uh, the one on the right has one shape, but at different scales. Uh, so this is one of the properties that tilings has. Another thing that you might ask about, and this goes back a bit to Martin's talk, is symmetry. So a Penrose tiling has five-fold symmetry, but only at one point, only right in the middle. The interesting quality of these tilings is that they never repeat. That is, they're aperiodic, to use a a fancy word. And that means if you take the tiling and shift it, you'll never find a place where it lines up perfectly again. And if you look at a, where's it gone? Yeah, if you look at a large version of it, before your eyes go funny, uh, you'll find that you can pick a point and it looks like actually here, it's perfect symmetry. We've got a nice little five-fold axis going on here. But if you go out from that, you'll always find a place where it breaks down and it changes um, because it provably never repeats over the surface, even though it looks quite similar. So this is a nice idea, but in order to work with it, we have to be able to make these things. Uh, and as a good kind of computational tinkerer, the first thing I, we did was go and uh, find some people who were doing it and get some code that would help us to do this. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we construct these tilings because to me, it's a bit non-intuitive, and it's one of these things where working computationally is a bit different to working conceptually. So if I saw something like this and I wanted to make it, I would think of starting with a tile and adding more tiles around it like we would do with physical things. It turns out if we're doing it computationally, the easiest way to do things is to start with some tiles and then chop them up smaller and smaller. So if we take the tiles that are in the top left, and we take just half of each of them, we get two triangles. And then each of these triangles, we have a special rule to replace it with smaller versions of the same set of triangles. So the larger triangle turns into two large ones and a pointy one, and the pointy triangle turns into one pointy one and one larger one. And if we do that, we take that and we split it up. N in the top left is the number of iterations, the number of times we've done this splitting. And at any point, we can add in the other halves of the tiles to get the tiling we want. But we can keep going and keep going and keep going and get finer and finer grained tilings. Uh, and if we want to make a complete surface, we can reflect it, we can rotate it, and then we've got a very nice tiling, which we can still keep making more and more fine grained until our eyes start growing, going a bit weird. Uh, so this was the, was the first step to say, OK, can we make one of these things? The interesting bit comes when we deform it. So get to, to get to this image, they've started with a Penrose tiling and then messed about with it. And we kind of like this because you get a very different perceptual effect as it goes through. Um, so there's a set of mathematical rules that say you look at any of the corners where the tiles meet. And if you find one that looks like number two, you move the middle point just a little bit in the direction of the arrow. And if you do that, you can take the pattern on the left and make the pattern on the, in the middle if you do it in one way and the pattern on the right if you do it in the other way. So after a whole bunch of coding, we got to the point where we could take one of these and we could deform it in one direction. You can see the orange ones have gotten a bit bigger uh, and there's now a few different shapes in there or in the other direction. And in this case, the blue ones get a bit bigger. That's great fun, but we can also start saying, okay, well, what if we put a gradient in there? So it changes from going in one direction at the top to being in the other direction at the bottom. Or we can put ripples in there. Uh, we can also start looking not so much at the tiles, but at the lines between them, which gives a different sense of what the pattern looks like. Uh, and then we can make it even more extreme uh, by making larger deformations to the point where it starts looking a bit pencil sketchy, but then eventually some levels of structure start coming back in and you can see the symmetries re-emerging. Uh, so as Martin was talking about parameters, we now have questions of how many iterations we do, so how fine-grained it is, but also 
what deformations we're applying, how much of them, what direction, and how they vary across the surface as a space for us to play in. And now I'll pass over to Teresa. So we have done all the background work, we've done all the research, we've done all the coding, um, we started to play around on the screen, but what we both got interested in, what, what happens if we actually put that into the physical world? As Martin surely knows, there's one part is making it on screen, the other part is actually seeing uh, how, how these ideas um, come out in, in the tangible world. Um, there are lots of good things about it, that's why we do it, and I thought uh, we show you where, where this journey took us. For a starting point, we, we picked up on the lines as these were the easiest or seemed for us at that time the easiest way to start an exploration. We are not totally leaving um, the screen space behind. We are um, writing a vector that can be read by CNC machines, so we're not quite in the totally hands-on work just yet, uh, but it gave us a chance to quickly um, bring material into the game and see, see what happens. Here's uh, a dry run. So yeah, the you will see later on um, in the in the in the in the objects really that before, but like we were more talking about the variables, kind of what kind of pattern do we want to create? But now with tools, uh, with um, with materials, we are losing that kind of flat surface and move more into a relief space, which means we need to think about the depth of the tool as well as the type of the tool and of course the type of material. Um, to start with, we started with plywood. Actually, we started with PE as well as we had some kicking around in the workshop. Uh, we quickly swapped to wood. Firstly, it's close to my practice. And then everyone who has had a plywood in their hand knows that um, people sometimes forget that it's still wood. Um, but actually, it is uh, th three or multiple layers of wood glued together, which means if you cut through it, you actually get the layers uh, coming, coming through as well, which we totally took to our advantage. Um, so here you see what what texture what texture can can come out of here, and you see a little bit these lines. If you put oil on it, you see these lines even bet even more, um, and that's a very good example of um, looking at these shapes. Uh, so this is something that was created by the tool um, to add to the pattern. Of course, if you would change the tool, it would get uh, different outcomes. Something else that happened in, in that process, uh, working with plywood, um, thin sheets of plywood being, being quite precise with the depth and how what, what we want uh, for, like um, in between of the conversation be between the lines as well as the planes. Um, we held it up through the window to have a better look at it and found that we really like how the light comes through. Um, so if you make a bit a bigger piece of it, it's not so much as the lines come through, but also the the material quality comes through. So the the red bit you see here is part is part of the timber. So if you would uh, cut that on a different bit of plywood or a different type of plywood, uh, it obviously would look different. You can frame it um, and hang it in your window, and then sometimes you can see it positive or negative. And that's actually the key to our next exploration, or nearly to our next exploration. Uh, there was one more bit that we um, picked up while we were starting to produce or play uh, with this pattern on the CNC machine. We um, started to quite enjoy watching the machine uh, finding its pathways that made sense um, to, to cut uh, this pattern. Um, so what we did, we have a first application here. We ended some randomness, uh, some purposeful randomness uh, to the patterns, um, which means that some of these patterns are being more inflated and some of them are being less inflated. Um, that means that we are not really talking about Penrose here anymore um, because some of the planes are overlapping other bits of the plane. So here we're really going into um, a very, very heavily uh, deformation that we can't call Penrose anymore. Uh, lastly, um, we kind of went from the screen to the relief, and now we thought, well, let's see if we can bring it up even a bit more. A material that came handy here was ceramics, like a moldable um, material. So we used the, the printed or the cut um, uh, plywood tiles as um, positives and pressed it into clay as negatives, which again gives a different view on, on that pattern. Here's a close-up of that one. Um, in the first instance, we molded it a little bit, 
um, like using round stones um, to bring the pattern more into the 3D space. Um, also, depending on like here, we pressed the the wooden plates quite heavily into the into the clay, um, which uh, created that outcome. Um, we did like, as we said at the start, that continuation of how one pattern morphs into the other one and still stays connected. But if you do the same thing, the same plates um, with a bit less pressure, you again get a different aspect of that same pattern. And our last slide here, that's where we are just now, um, cutting it, um, letting to totally go of the algorithm uh, and letting the hands play. So thank you very much. Um, if you want to, any more questions, we have two, three minutes now before the next person is lined up. Yeah, um, thank you.